Hi and welcome to Magic Numbers. This is episode number 79 and today we're going to talk about how to get better using the 17 lens data and in particular how to get better when you're a beginning player or when you are struggling with your win rate, which steps to take to improve them um, in a relatively quickly way by only improving how you draft. Now this is not going to solve everything and it's not going to tell you how to play the game because uh, a lot of win rate comes from the ability to play superiorly and have a better uh, sequencing of spells and, and better foresight of what opponents can be doing. But a lot of stuff can be improved by um, using the data and I'm going to tell you more or less how to do it so that you can use it for next format or for this format still. Um, but before we go into that, I would like to thank my sponsor, mtgazon.com. Um, I write articles for them and I'm going to write this article as well um, as a sort of like a guide how to use 17 lands how to improve um, your win rate and, and what you should be asking yourself if you want to improve. Um, this podcast is also sponsored by you. Uh, well, can be sponsored by you or is sponsored by you if you're one of my patrons. Um, on my Patreon, I would um, recommend joining it. I do have some awards, um, including access to slides for this presentation or uh, including uh, being able to ask a question. And with that out of the way, we can move to the uh, actual topics. But before we start, um, there is always my preamble. And normally it's about the game, but this time it's going to be more about the social uh, aspect of the game. Um, and my idea is that Popper's paradox is useful. And if you don't know what Popper paradox is, uh, it basically states that if you would want to have a perfectly tolerant society, um, instantly people that are intolerant would dominate it. Because if you tolerate everything, then you also have to tolerate the lack of tolerance and that thing will spread. And because of that, Popper's paradox means if you want to have a tolerant community, you need to not tolerate intolerance because that will ruin it. And it comes, the paradox is really sort of only, um, it's 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 not really a paradox. It's it's, it's an apparent paradox. Um, what it means that if you have a system and there is some key element of that system, things that are against that key element uh, can't be um, can't be accepted because, of course, uh, accepting the thing that defeats the whole idea of the system is going to ruin the system. And obviously, the example uh, we had in recent days was uh, the fact that. Aragorn in the new set, uh, based on Lord of the Rings, is not exactly as described by the book, which is, you know, a criticism that some people say maybe in in good faith, but a lot of criticism of that comes from, uh, well, I, I won't call it differently, just straight up racism. Um, there is absolutely no need for Aragorn and the card game that has dragons in them, uh, Aragorn based on the book that has dragon in them, um, to be. Um, to be perfectly white because it was written like that um, uh, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 70 years ago. Was it 70? 70 years ago. Um, the point is that um, book was written in one reality. We are living in a different reality. This reality should not uh, repeat the mistakes of previous realities. It should uh, go on with the modern time. And I think that one of the ideas of both uh, magic creators and the uh, Tolkien estate is to increase increase inclusivity of the novel, not only because they love diversity, but also because it's good for their business. And um, I like it that um, tolerance of uh, uh, different uh, types of people embracing the whole diversity goes hand in hand with um, goes hand in hand with money because that means that uh, at least there is a future in a more diverse and inclusive uh, society that I wish to very much be a part of. All right. Therefore, I love the fact that uh, there's uh, multiple lifestyles, creeds, races presented on magic cards. And I absolutely love the community being very adamant that uh, this is what we want. And if you don't like it, um, then the problem is with you because that means that magic community is applying Popper's paradox um, and therefore uh, has a chance of staying inclusive rather than getting dominated by the elements that want to destroy this inclusivity based on some bad ideas, basically. Right, with that out of the way, 
we can move to the question of the week. And the question comes from Marius. And uh, his question was, I'm paraphrasing. It was a long exchange, but in the end, I had to digest, uh, distill a question out of it. Uh, the question was, how does mulliganing impact the game results? And um, I dived into uh, MUM data from, um, from Best of One Drafts. Um, and uh, I decided to look at it through the win rate of uh, the players that are making the mulliganing decision. And um, the 17 lines data has brackets of win rates. Um, and this, of course, means the percentage average roughly where does the average uh, win rate of the player uh, analyzed fall into. And I looked at the uh, most common brackets between 50% win rate and 64% win rate. And first thing you can see is that um, people who win more mulligan less. And this is not that they win more because they mulligan less. It is because they mulligan less because uh, <laughs> uh, they mulligan less and therefore they win uh, more to some extent. I think it's um, it's been shown time and time again uh, across different sets that there is this big trend that top win rate players tend to mulligan slightly less. They will pick those two land hands um, uh, because they see potential in them. And also because they build decks in a way that um, doesn't make them, doesn't make the uh, two lander almost a certain mulliganing decision. And this is very important. You have to, in order to mulligan less, you need to build your deck that are resilient to mulligan. So you need to have enough two drops. You need to have early interaction. But also in many cases, um, you need to make maybe bolder decisions. Um, and why is that? Um, I also looked at the win rates uh, uh, based on this win bracket. And in the red, you see the win rate within the bracket. As you, as you see, it's very close to the number that the bracket is describing, which is absolutely not surprising because those brackets were made based on that number. Um, and then you can see the win rate uh, after the mulligan. And when you see, it's also increasing slightly, you know, uh, accord accordingly, which means that the cost of the mulligan um, is staying roughly the same independent of your generic win rate. So uh, whether you're the 50% win rate player or 64% win rate player, uh, you're going to pay roughly 13, 14 uh, percentage points of your win rate when you take a decision to mulligan. And this is why it's sometimes not a terrible idea to keep those two lender hands, especially when you have a bunch of uh, early drops. You have good 60, 70% of drawing a third land uh, within your first three round turns. And um, you should be operational at that stage. It's not maybe that you know you won't have a perfect game if you do it, but um, mulliganing is going to almost certainly decrease your win rate by so much that uh, sometimes it's worth to take a gamble that you are going to draw this third land. Uh, so in my opinion, um, Whenever I take a mulligan, it's usually because I have a two lander that also does not provide me with a uh, diversity of mana. So uh, let's say I have two white mana, I have a bunch of blue spells in my hand, then I will decide to take a mulligan in best of one. If I have uh, a blue and a white, um, and I have like you know one, two, two drops, uh, which I should have if I build my deck correctly when I have five spells in my hand, um, then I will probably keep. Um, and if I have two white lands and um, uh, four white cards and the two drops are also white, I'm still going to keep it and hope that I will draw into the second color of mana or I will only draw white spells until the end, which is also a possibility. And I think that this um, this kind of decision making is increasing your win rate sort of because you take fewer of those games when you drop 14 percentage uh, points of your win rate uh, out of them. So that's... Um, that's the answer uh, to Mario. And that's my advice. Mulligan much less. Uh, better players mulligan less. And part of how they achieve it is building your decks correctly in such a way that will make mulliganing less necessary. Uh, but still, be a bit bolder and try to keep a couple of those hands. Try to feel um, how good the decision is. The problem, of course, is that we are very good at remembering when you kept a two lander and then you never drew a third land. Um, we are maybe less inclined to remember when you took a um, um, uh, when you took a um, 
I didn't take a mulligan and, and you managed to uh, draw into your third land. We don't seem to remember that. It used very often in our head, it, it becomes, oh, well, I did things right and I won and that's good because I'm good. Um, but of course, if you don't take a mulligan, don't draw lands, you start blaming external factors. Um, okay. So I divided this uh, seminar into four steps, if I remember correctly. Um, I'm basically going to look at different aspects of how you can improve. And I thought I started with, at least in my head, I started with uh, the one that is the most basic one. And um, uh, the more beginner player you are, uh, the more you should pay attention to it. And as we progress, I think that they're going to get slightly more um, granular points um, that will be focusing on maybe more intermediate players. Uh, but I think step one is don't play bad cards. And this is something that's been said time and time again. I think that uh, one of the big proponents of that idea is um, Corticals. And I'm not going to lie, I listen to Corticals a lot. And I get um, inspired by what he's saying. So, um, And I listen very carefully to his ideas because they are very frequently very good. And this idea definitely stuck in my head when I started analyzing data because obviously... If he says don't play bad cards, that means that uh, players may play bad cards, and um, especially players with lower win rate may play bad cards. And actually, I always sort of took it uh, on face value uh, from what Alex said, and I never tested it. So I decided to test it for the first time, um, and I'm going to show you some of the results. But uh, beginner players fall in bad card traps. Uh, for multiple reasons. We're going to discuss the reason as we are starting to look at data on examples from the current set. Uh, now, seeing which cards are playing bad is, I think, one of the biggest and easiest level ups possible in Limited. And if you are struggling with your decks, if you don't have a high win rate, um, then I think that would be the first step uh, to self-diagnose, uh, in my opinion. It would be to look at what you're drafting, look at which cards you're playing, and seeing if you're playing the cards that are sort of bad uh, more frequently than you should. And uh, then possibly think about why you're uh, picking those cards uh, and playing them. Because there, oh, again, might be a couple of reasons. And then bet evaluation occurs at two levels. Um, first, at draft, and second, uh, when you're building your deck. So first, obviously, is you pick the cards that are not good, and maybe you pick them too early. Um, maybe um, you, um, given a choice of two cards, you pick the wrong one because, um, again, we'll dive into reasons. And then, of course, the fact that you drafted the card doesn't mean that you're going to play it. Um, uh, but very frequently, those beginner players will put those cards in their decks for again, a multitude of reasons. So um, don't play bad cards is an easy say, but how to actually figure out which cards are sort of bad and, 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 and um, how to avoid them. So um, first of all, um, the 17 Lands offers several options. One of them is the card performance uh, tab uh, on the web website where you have um, uh, a table with a bunch of uh, parameters for each card. You got the rarity, color, name, uh, but you also have number of the cards seen and number of the card picked. Uh, and you have those two numbers, for example, Attentive Sky Warden, uh, it was seen roughly 280,000 times. It was picked roughly 30,000 times. So uh, divide those two numbers by each other, you get like 12%, 11% uh, rate of picking the card, um, which is not a lot. Um, then you have Boonbringer Valkyrie. It was seen 10,500 times. It was picked 8,000 times. So, you know, 70 something percent of the time the card was picked. Now, if you look at those numbers, you can clearly see that 17 lens users uh, are high on the Boonbringer Valkyrie. That's a five mana rare. Obviously, the card is really, really strong. Attentive Sky Warden is just a poor common. And because of that, it's not picked very highly. Uh, looking at those two numbers from the general group, um, you will probably not get into, um, you will not get, you know, too deep conclusions, but you can actually filter the table by uh, category of players and you can select top players. And these are players that are, have 
you know, roughly 60% win rate on 17 lands. And you can select um, the players with lower win rates, uh, which will be around, uh, off the top of my head, around 50%, I guess. And then you can do the same kind of analysis. You can compare the pick rate of certain cards by this top group and by this lower group. And by looking at those, you can actually start figuring out which cards are uh, evaluated highly by the uh, uh, top players, which cards are evaluated highly by the lower group of the players, and therefore maybe try to figure out which are particular trappy kind of bad cards. Um, so in order to look at it, I looked at the pick rate between top and the bottom players, and um, I focused on the cards that the bottom players prioritize over the top players. So for example, Invasion of Belenon, uh, top players pick it 10% of the time they see it. Um, uh, bottom uh, tier uh, players on 17 lands pick it on around 20% of the time. So there's almost twofold difference between how frequently uh, this card is being picked. This means that um, uh, the bottom players see something in that card, um, uh, and it's you know it's quite uh, apparent that they evaluate it much higher than the top players. Now, obviously, win rate is not everything, but Top players win quite a lot, and that shouldn't be discounted in any way. So if you want to um, win more, and you do like to draft your Invasion of Belenon, uh, you should probably think very hard whether you want to play it or not, and think why they don't play it and why they avoid it. I'm not saying that you shouldn't play it. In fact, my last trophy deck did have an Invasion of Belenon, but there were some conditions that I had to... Um, fulfill in order to fit it in my deck. And one of them was having three Marshals of Zalfir, which changes the equation a lot, because instead of paying three mana and getting a 2-2 two, two Vigilant Knight, very frequently in this deck, I played it, and uh, for three mana, I got a 3-3 three, three Vigilant Knight. And of course, 3-3 three, three Vigilant Knight can flip it much easier, um, um, and because it can flip it much more easier, then um, I can get the benefit, and then my knight becomes even bigger, and there's like a bunch of stuff that goes on in there. But if you play it as a creature, a three mana, two, two vigilant knight is not a very strong card. In fact, in the set, you have a two, two vigilant knight for three mana with backup one, which means that its floor is a three, three vigilant knight, which is much better than Invasion of Belenon. If your deck is not built very well to flip it, and most white decks will not be built very well to flip it because uh, as I showed in some previous uh, seminars, um, white decks want to kill very quickly and attacking the battle is not a very beneficial thing for those decks because if they attack the battle, they don't attack the face. If they don't attack the face, they don't decrease the life total of the player and their late game is really, really poor. And because of that, it's very hard to flip Invasion of Belenon and still win the game, even though you have this Anthem effect. And there is a bunch of cards that um, are overvalued by the... Um, um, uh, that that uh, are overvalued by this bottom tier of the players. I think that's some good examples. Seraph of New Capanna, only 7.8% uh, picked uh, by um, by the top players, 157 by the bottom group of players. 7.8 is also like a significant uh, number. Everything below 12.5% means that um, uh, this group of players actively doesn't want to have the card and other group of the player actively wants to have a card. So there is this dissonance between um, between those two groups of players. Why? Well, if you think about it, if there was a very, very bad card, uh, let's say it's a card that says, when you draft this card, you lose your next game. Now, obviously, you don't want to pick this card because if you do, you will lose your next game. But if it's open in the wrong spot of the table and no one is going to pick it, it will come back to you and you will have to pick it. Therefore, it, because it will randomly be opened across the table, if you have thousands and thousands of games, 12.5%, uh, so one eighth of the time, it will be opened in a seat that will force you to pick it. And because no one will pick it um, uh, uh, from those packs because they don't want to lose the game, um, you're going to be forced to pick it. That's for 12.5% is the sort of like a minimal rate of cards that no one wants. If it's below that, it means that you don't want to pick it, but someone else will. And uh, this means that the top players evaluate the uh, Seraph of New Capanna as a card that they actively don't want to pick and um, uh, because the, the number here is so low. 
while the players that are in the bottom tier they do pick it uh, and they do pick it over that 12.5 percent uh, rate which means that um, they are actively wanting to play that card uh, at least in some extent um, what other cards do we have here invasion of Belenon and invasion of dominaria are uh, two white cards that just don't play very well in white decks because their plan is too slow for what those decks are trying to achieve in their good versions. Uh, Renata Call to the Hunt. Um, um, that is a card that just costs too much mana for what it does in this format. It's basically a um, four mana X3, where X is the devotion to green, which probably means it's like a three, three, maybe four, three. Whenever you a creature you control enters the battlefield, it enters uh, the battlefield with a one plus one plus one counter. And very often this card will be killed on spot and does nothing. Uh, and also it can be killed usually with uh, favorable mana. Um, and if it stays, it can do some damage, but um, um, the decks that put Renata into their um, uh, 40 cards are very frequently too stuck on the counter synergy. Uh, while I think that the best version of the white green decks where Renata would be normally played, um, don't want to go too deep on the counter synergy because it's just um, an unfeasible uh, strategy because there's just not enough payoffs and not enough enablers. Like, not all of those cards where there is a big difference are completely unwanted by the uh, top players. And Seal from Existence, the one white white uh, enchantment that exiles a permanent uh, until. Um, um, seal from existence is in play. This is actively picked by the white players, but not heavily as heavily prioritized as by the bottom tier players. Um, and part of it is because this card is strong. It's an Oblivion Ring kind of effect. And it does have ward, uh, which makes it difficult to remove. But its cost is not only three mana, but two of that mana is white, which means it's not a trivial card to cast. And it's not a trivial card to cast while you're trying to apply pressure on your opponent. Um, and um, in most cases with these decks, uh, you probably want to put another creature on board rather than uh, uh, spend three mana to remove a creature of the opponent. Um, sealed from existence would be an amazing card in many formats. So it's not a bad card at all. I think it's a card that even has some constructed potential. Um, the problem with it is it just aligns pretty badly with what white wants to be doing in this format. Uh, white wants to be super aggressive, and this is more of a control card. And uh, because of that, it clashes with what the color wants to be doing. So uh, that's the problem, Mercurio. Um, then we have some other cards. Another invasion is there. Um, uh, as you can see, white is a specifically a bad color for invasions. Um, and invasion of Moak is um, a white green one. Um, uh, where I think especially that card is just um, not very good. You need a very specific version of white green, and um, um, and uh, and it comes together very rarely. Uh, JPSN fifty four says most cards are white, which tells me white is overdrafted amongst bottom players. Um, I think that this is only a partial answer to it. Uh, these cards are not only white, but these are specifically Cards that are white but don't fit with what white wants to be doing. And I think that this is even a bigger part of the problem. There is a bunch of white cards that pull in the direction of playing a longer game. And white is just not strong enough equipped to play that kind of game in this format. And and and, and top players realize it and they focus on their um, aerial boosts and their free one uh, first track knights. Um, while the bottom players they might not realize how streamlinedly aggressive um, must white deck be in this format. Uh, and they try to go into those more mid-range slash control piles. And those things just do very badly because there is just not enough tools to help those decks. Uh, Mercurio says, uh, this makes sense. Red-white seems to be um, very aggressive and would rather have combat tricks over removal spells unless they are cheap, efficient ones like Volcanic Spite. That is exactly it. I mean, um, when you can play a combat trick for free, like uh, aerial boost, and use it as a removal because your opponent is forced to block your 3 3 on their 3 3 uh, or even 4 4, and you can just stop two creatures that are attacking because so many of them have vigilance, um, that's a more efficient play and it kills the creature. Yes, they gain some life, that's fine. Um, aerial boost can also be later used as a killing spell. So um, uh, there is that upside of having it. 
while loss of removal, you can just kill a creature and, and that's it. And if you spend too much mana on killing the creature, you can't deploy another one, which puts you a bit behind in the race. You want to be playing creatures on every turn and still be able to cast your interaction. And aerial boost can do it. Uh, seal from existence, you need to dedicate, almost certainly you will dedicate a whole turn to play it. And if the game goes so long that you can actually cast it and maybe cast something else, um, um, then uh, then probably it's so late in the game that you're already unfavored. Uh, and I think that, you know, uh, that was also in one of the previous seminars, but um, white blue deck, for example, has 60% uh, win rate and, and above that until uh, turn seven, eight. But after turn eight, it drops off. And, you know, like at turn 10, you only have like 48% win rate uh, in those decks. So that drops so very steeply. And this eighth turn is so, um, uh, so crucial for you to, um, um, to, so crucial for you um, uh, to kill your opponent before that happens. And playing additional removal and dedicating whole turns to that is not going to be the solution you want. Um, uh, this, by the way, this list only has uncommons. I, I could have done the same for commons and rares, but they are slightly less interesting. I thought that the data about uh, the disproportion between uh, pick rate um, of those cards is the most interesting at the uncommon level. And yeah, the chat is right. Lots of those cards are white. Uh, what else do you have there? Tiller of Flash, another card that would be good in many formats. Uh, that's the 2-4. Whenever you target um, an opponent, opposing creature with the spell, um, uh, you uh, uh, incubate 2. Uh, invasion Mark, invasion that puts plus 1, plus 1 counters on everything. That's technically an aggressive card. Um, but I think that the temptation there is there to uh, to start attacking it, and that might be also like a gameplay mistake maybe the card is better than we give it to but i think that there are just better cards that are alternatives to invasion of mark like storm the seed core um that you can play um that do always something even if you only have one creature because it distributes four counters uh so in like 90 percent of the situation storm the seed core is just going to be a better version of invasion of mark despite you know not having a creature on its backside there's daxos um, which I think that um, beginner players are sort of seeing it as a two drop, but uh, actually if you play your normal 9-8 split, you have 40% um, chance that you are not going to draw uh, two planes uh, by uh, turn two, which means that Daxus will very often become like a later um, uh, creature. It is good in racing situations against other aggressive decks, but it doesn't help you winning those mid-range uh, matchups or, or decks that want to go long. It, it will not help you much because it's just a 2-2-4-2. Two, two, two. Um, we have Harid uh, Artisan. That's a 2-3 haste that flips into a 3-4 angel. Is it angel? I think it is an angel um, with flying and haste. Um, that card is just not, not good enough, right, I think, for this format. Uh, it just doesn't do enough. And we have Elspeth Smite, um, which is a one mana deal free to target attacking or blocking creature. White decks, as I said, want to be aggressive, so very often this kind of removal is not great because um, it doesn't deal with the big creature, which are your main problem. It deals with small creatures, which you can possibly, you know, your deck should be able to trade for those and, and, and still come ahead or play a combat trick that has some other utility later in the game. Uh, the worst case scenario is that, you know, you, you draw the Elspeth Smite uh, when you just needed an extra creature or an extra way to push damage. Now, if you draw Aerial Boost in the same situation, you can push damage because you can get something flying. Uh, if you draw Elspeth Smite in this situation, you have a pretty much useless spell, especially if the opponent casts something like a 6-6 six, six or 6-5. Six, Okay, so that's the first thing. This is the mistake that bottom tier players pick certain cards, and these are the example of such cards uh, when the top players are not going to pick them. Uh, okay, so I also looked at um, at the pick rate of the bottom half of the cards in the whole set uh, by the top players and by the uh, 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 so top players are in red and the, the bottom tier players are in blue. And um, in those bottom half cards by win rate, 14% um, 
pick rate for the top players and 17.2% uh, pick rate by those bottom players. We're talking about 170 cards in here, which uh, translates, you know, three percentage points difference uh, between those two groups mean that uh, there's going to be a lot of bad cards in the pools of those bottom players because they pick them actively much higher than the top players do. And this will lead to weaker decks because they will have several of those poorer cards. And this is how you lose by playing bad cards. Uh, you basically have a deck that has some good top, uh, but then the last six, seven cards in your deck are poor. And in a uh, longer game or in some games, you will just disproportionately draw a lot of those poor cards and you're going to lose those games because of course you're playing bad cards that don't do much and uh, your opponent if they are um playing correctly and they are avoiding those um, bottom half win rate cards are going to have stronger average spells stronger lower spell so even if they draw six poorest spells in their deck they are still going to outplay you because their six bottom cards are stronger than your six bottom cards and that's it so even if you pick the bad cards, you don't have to play them. So I calculated whether there is a difference between how the good, uh, the top uh, win rate players and the bottom win, uh, tier win rate players are uh, playing those cards after they pick them. And of course, it's hard to get it from the data uh, like this. I can see number of the times that the card was picked and some couple of columns from here, I'll have the number of games played. But of course, people with 60% average game win rate uh, are, going to, um, are going to win much more just because they have a higher win rate. So they will see more games. Because of that, I had to normalize those numbers by the player group win rate. So basically, I recalculated this, uh, how many games you play by the, how many times you picked for the top players as if they had the same win rate as the bottom tier players, um, which you know can be done easily by multiplying the um, number of games played by the fraction of average win rate in the bottom player group by the average win rate in the top player group. And then you get sort of normalization through that. So these are the cards where there's the biggest difference. And we see another time, uh, the Seraph of New Capena, uh, which in top player group is played two and a half games every time it was picked. Now, every time, um, even with 50% win rate, every kind of, um, every time you pick a card uh, and, you, and you play it, you will play roughly five to six games with it. Let's say five and a half games with it if you have a 50% win rate. So, um, this number here is uh, 3.5, which means that it's been played 3.5 divided by 5.5. So, you know, 7 divided by 11, roughly, you know, 70% of the time. Uh, and top player group, it's 2.5 um, uh, because I averaged the win rate to 50% roughly uh, by, uh, by 2.5, by 5.5. So, um, it becomes like five divided by uh, 11. So instead of 70%, we are closer to 50%. Um, so quite a big difference in how frequently are people playing. And here is a bunch of cards that um, people uh, in the bottom tier play much more. We have the Seraph of New Capena, Copper Host Crusher, the eight mana, uh, eight, eight uh, hexproof creature. Um, eight mana is a lot. For eight mana, I want game winning effect. And this card very often is not a game winning effect. Um, Tiller of Flesh, another card from the previous list. Uh, Invasion of Dominaria. Ravenous Sailback. This card, Bribbleback, is asking um, is Ravenous Sailback bad? Yes and no. It's not bad in the sense that, oh yeah, the card definitely does a lot. Um, it can be an enchantment removal, an artifact removal. It can be a hasty threat and maybe a color that people don't expect haste from and therefore be able to flip a battle. But on the other hand, it is a five mana spell. And I think that especially in this format, and this is to some extent format specific, especially in this format, you want to have your five drops be much more impactful. I would name maybe 
very few five drops at uncommon level which are playable in, in, in my decks. I will sometimes play Ravenous Sailback, but I'm not going to be super happy about it. Um, you know, I want my five drop to be a Glissa. I want my five drop to be a Shieldred. Now, these are extreme examples of bombs, but um, th these are the power of the cards that I aspire to rather than, um, uh, rather than Sailback. And as Infinite Breakfast, as Eric says, Sailback has been low floor and high ceiling, I think, but not quite worth it on average. And this is the thing that um, I think one of the problems with beginner players when they evaluate cards, they see the best scenario and they don't put proportions of good and bad scenarios in the right way. Um, so um, if the sailback is 10% of the time um, amazing and 90% of the time it's meh, for me, it's basically almost always meh. Uh, of course, if it was 50% of the time amazing and 50% of the time uh, meh, then I would reevaluate it and play it maybe more frequently. But it's not. Uh, in my experience, it's uh, quite, quite a lot. Uh, most of the time, it's just an okay card. I think, I, you know, I would prefer in my five group slot to play something like Tangled Sky Skyline, which gives me five life, which produces a five, five that I can flip for two mana and does quite a lot of things. Um, it's an enchantment that stays on board and lets me deal with flyers, uh, which is a great skill of this card, especially when I have a couple of Phyrexid cards. And Ravenous Sailback is just much, much weaker than that card. So I'm not going to go out of my way to pick it, and because I'm not going to go out of my way of picking it, I will also not go out of my way putting it in my deck. I will have it in my pool sometimes. I'm just uh, very rarely going to play it. I did play it because you, I think... Every card is on some kind of a spectrum of playability. It's just that uh, some cards should be played very sparsingly. And some cards are actually, for me, a signal that something went, didn't go quite well with my draft. If I put a Ravenous Sailback in my deck, I probably did something wrong in my picks, or I tried to draft a color that was not fully open, and and and, and I'm going to probably pay a price for that. Um, So you say it has been good against you. Well, it it, it, it does happen, but that doesn't mean that um, uh, you've seen everything. It's just like uh, maybe it was stranded in hand uh, a lot of the times when you played against it, you don't even know that because a person uh, didn't want to cast it because there was no good targets for the ability and the three for haster was not exactly what they were looking for. Um, and we also have Renata on that list. Uh, we have... Two other invasions, uh, Kamigawa and New Capena. We didn't see those before, but they are running into the same problems as the previously mentioned um, uh, uh, previously mentioned invasions. They just don't do enough on the front side, and flipping them is not such a big deal. Invasion of Kamigawa makes a two three that when it deals uh, combat damage to a player, it uh, draws a card, which is just not enough in this uh, format. Uh, the four mana tap a creature and it doesn't untap um, uh, next turn is very overpriced for this effect. You should be paying two mana, one mana for that kind of an effect and flipping it into a creature that costs like four mana and you know you will have to spend some attacks to do it and, and maybe craft them even that's the game that's not worth playing. It's a card that should be hard avoided and um, I would say arguably never played. Uh, and I think top players do understand it because their play rate of this card is much lower. I'm pretty sure that this is based on the uh, full run of the current format um, uh, in terms of the data. I think if you would look at the three uh, last three weeks, that 2.2 games played per pick uh, is going to drop even further. So, yeah. Um, so... Um, JPN54 says the only cards that they cast from this group was Seraph of Nukapena and Sailback, um, but also those a uh, few times. Yeah, I mean, I did cast the Invasion of Moag once or twice as well uh, earlier in the format, but uh, it, that's the general problem is that uh, those cards should be avoided. But of course, this is a specific example for this format. Um, if you want to do it yourself, you can go to 17 lands. And you can look at the um, 
how often are cards played and look at the most played cards and maybe even a given archetype and look at the top players and the bottom group of players and maybe see which cards that the top players don't seem to play but the bottom players seem to play quite a lot um, uh, are you personally uh, playing and then maybe come to the conclusion that maybe I should be playing less of that particular card. Uh, that's my advice for uh, that particular group of players. Uh, what else do we have here? Hurried Artisan, that also was in the previous list, and Invasion of Moag, and that also was in the previous list. And the fact that multiple of those cards were on both lists is pretty significant because it shows a systemic problem. Uh, because picking the worst cards more frequently and then also playing them more frequently compounds. So if, let's say, let's stick with this um, uh, Seraph of New Capena, it was played twice more frequently uh, by the bottom players uh, than by the top players, picked uh, twice more frequently. And then still, when you look at this data, it was still roughly 40% more played once picked um, uh, than by the top bottom players than the top players. Um, so... If you look at both of those things, you have twice in the other one, and then you have another 40% from uh, frequency of the play. Uh, so two times um, uh, 1.4, which will be something like uh, two and a half times uh, more likely to see a Seraph of New Capena on the battlefield if you look at the deck of, um, of a bottom tier player than of the top tier player. And that's quite a big difference. Um, and I calculated this kind of ratio for um, all the cards. I think two biggest offenders, Jingitaxia's Core Ogre. Um, it's been over eight times more frequently played by the bottom players than the top players. And Seizan, Perverter of Truth, that's also eight times more played by the bottom players than the top players. Here we have first of the big traps of the beginner players. They look at the rarity symbol and a large part of their evaluation is through the lens of that um, uh, rarity symbol. And also maybe rarity slash um, uh, power and toughness. They will look at this, oh, this is pretty big and uh, and mythic, That therefore it must be great. Well, Jinkitaxia says 10 mana, lose the game. That's basically the ability it has because you have to draw seven cards every turn. And if you do it for two, three turns and don't kill your opponent, uh, you're going to mill yourself out. Saison is the similar thing. It is a thing that you play. It's big. It gives opponent two cards because they can draw two cards and lose two life. Um, and then if they deal with it on the same turn, they end up using a removal, killing the big creature, and drawing two cards and losing two life. That's a good deal for them, not for you. Uh, because on that exchange, you probably spent more mana. Uh, you both lost the card, so you're net zero on cards, but you didn't draw anything, and maybe, you, know, you, you didn't lose two life. Hooray, hooray. Um, and then you have a bunch of cards that are like this, like Vorinclex's Voice of Hunger, another pretty poor mythic rare from the uh, Multiverse Legend slot. It's just 8 mana, 7, 6. The second ability is not that important, and um, you shouldn't be playing it. Um, you have the Copper Host Crusher, the 8 mana Rhino. It's a big creature, even has Trample, but still 8 mana is quite a lot, um, so... Um, uh, so you will very often die with it in your hand. Uh, Fire Song and Sun Speaker, that's a white-red card that is not enough powerful and doesn't have enough synergy in this format to be to be really good. Um, another card that um, uh, low win rate players seem to love is Yargo. That's a four, more, over four times more frequently played than um, um, uh, by the bottom tier players and then top tier players. Atraxas Fall, uh, bottom tier players play it four times more frequently than um, uh, than top tier players. Uh, just doesn't align with the format enough. If you need it as your interaction, then probably you drafted something wrongly and um, you should have had better interaction in order to go into particular colors. Or maybe you didn't prioritize the interaction high enough and um, because of that you end up in a deck that sort of forced to play this attracts as fall, but the card is just not good. That's the problem. Um, of interesting cards, Infected Defector, that's a 5-mana knight, it's a 4-3, dies into it, incubate 3-3. Three, three. This is just not enough uh, rate for the cost that you have to pay for it. 
it's a knight with technically knight synergies, but it's just too expensive if you want to end your game on turn seven. You'd rather be double spelling on turn five rather than playing the infected knight, uh, infected defector. You will play it on occasions, but uh, but you shouldn't be playing it frequently. Then there is the you know appeal of build around, and I think that Lathiel, the bounteous, the bounteous dawn, uh, that the two two unicorn for two green white. Uh, with lifelink and whenever you gain life uh, and at the end of turn you'll put counters on uh, target other creature than Latiel uh, for each life that you gained in a given particular turn. Um, so yeah, these are the kind of cards that you probably want to be um, uh, want to be um, avoiding. There, there's a couple of niche rares on that list as well, like uh, into the fire. Uh, complete the circuit and um, Tessa, Tessa Karloff, for example. Um, so yeah, these cards not only are picked more frequently and played more frequently, they also, most of the cards on that list have a very poor win rate. I think one exemption from, uh, from that is changing the equation. Um, who knows, maybe that card is actually more playable than we think because... Um, Top players do have a decent win rate with it, uh, but they tend not to play it, which might mean that uh, they don't evaluate it highly enough despite it merits it. Um, or it might mean that there is very few decks that this card fits into, and of course top players identify those decks and use the card to their advantage. So, I think that the important part is that I'm not going to only give you data, but I'm giving you some actionable steps uh, that you can take. And based on those actions, you can improve how you play. So for this first step of not playing bad cards, my actions that I would recommend would be look at the cards you're playing that top players avoid um, and think about those cards. Why do top players might be evaluating those cards differently? Um, you know, ask. Uh, go to the chat of some Twitch streamer that plays a lot and say, look, I'm playing a lot of this card. I'm playing a lot of um, Seraph of New Capena. Um, it seems like good players don't play it. How do you evaluate the card, and why do you think it might be weaker than than I think? And 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 you know, it doesn't mean that a streamer that um, has sixty five percent win rate is the oracle and they understand everything. But I'm pretty sure that in the case of most of those cards, they will give you very good reasons why the card is not as strong as you think it is. Um, and uh, based on that, you might. Reevaluate what you're doing with it. Um, then think if you're playing those cards because you want to play with them or because you have to play with them. And here I go on a slight tangent, but I think that there are two big reasons why um, uh, bottom tier players uh, play bad cards. And this is based partially on looking at some decks um, during the FNMs that I play in, in, in real life, because there you have like a better overview of what's going, what's going on the pod. You talk with people, you can sort of get the picture of what was happening during the draft. And frequently I will see a couple of people having um, cards that I would never put in my deck in their deck. And then I'd say, well, can we look through the sideboard? What do you have there? And they have nothing. Uh, but then I see that they have like you know, 14 red cards in their sideboard and they're playing blue-white. And that means that they um, were indecided whether they will play red or blue in their uh, white aggro deck. And in the end, what happened is that they didn't get on playables in neither of the colors. And that's the situation when you have to play bad cards because you just couldn't decide early enough um, whether you should be uh, dedicating to one or the other color. And then maybe the pack three didn't align just as perfectly as you thought it might be, and you end up with just a shortage of playables. You have to play those bad cards. Um, but looking at the data and the fact that the um, uh, bottom tier players also uh, pick those um, cards that are not doing so well higher than the top players, I would say that more often than not, it's not because um, um, because people are dirtling too much and cannot decide on the color until it's too, way too late. But I think that most of the time, it's active preference of particular cards. And 
I don't know, everyone that plays limited for a long time has met with this person that uh, claims that the card is great despite uh, all the evidence against it, but they will just stick to it and want to play with it. And it's hard to explain to them. Uh, my advice would be don't be that person. Uh, if you want to improve in limited, I would listen carefully what people that win more than I do uh, have to say. I'm also paying quite a lot of attention to what people that win less than I do uh, have to say, because I think that uh, listening to opinions, even if you disagree with them and evaluating them and thinking about them, this is what's going to make you a better player. And if you don't have the mindset of evaluating the cards and actively looking for answers to questions that you have, you are forever going to stay at a uh, uh, lower win rate because it won't improve because you are too stuck in your ideas and you're not willing to uh, reevaluate what you're thinking. And biggest part of learning is actually reevaluation of what you know. And uh, yeah, this is... Uh, um, um, this is, I think, that uh, one, one of the reasons. So think about whether you're playing those cards because you want to or because you have to. If you play them because you want to, it's in, on one hand easy to change that because you just need to change what you want. Um, if it's because you have to, you have to start thinking about how you navigate your drafts and how you, uh, when do you decide which colors you are. And um, how often do you uh, journal? How often do you speculate on cards? And how late do you speculate on those cards? And maybe think about um, there is a moment when you have to just say, okay, I'm, I'm in this colors uh, and that's it. Uh, I don't recommend forcing. Uh, um, I do recommend drafting with preferences, but I still stay open until certain uh, certain moment. Uh, so yeah, these are the, the thoughts that you can have on this first step. Um, step two, the opposite, play good cards. Now, it's actually knowing which cards are good is a much easier skill because good cards are quite apparently good in most cases. And actually, I looked at data and in terms of good cards, there is a pretty decent agreement between top and the bottom tier um, in terms of um, what people are playing. Still, there are some types of cards that elude beginner players. And again, two good reasons for that. One, uh, these are cards whose greatness is not as visible. Uh, and uh, two, these are cards that often require a much better gameplay than maybe beginner player will have, which means that even if they play it, they don't get uh, very good results with them, which leads them to a you know rational from the point of view of, uh, of of a beginner player decision that I play with this card it does nothing to for me uh, therefore I will avoid playing it but this is the moment to step back and 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 look at the data and see well I mean it doesn't do much for me but I see that really good players uh, it does a lot to them and they do love playing that card and um, uh, and I don't uh, and this is the moment to, to look in the mirror and say well maybe there's something wrong with me? And then, of course, the answer is no, it's the children's fault. Um, but, you know, in a serious way, uh, if you can't make the card work, look at the data, think about particular cards that you're doing badly with, uh, despite top players having big success uh, with those cards, uh, and think, what do they do differently? And again, ask questions, watch people play and see what they're doing with particular card, how they build their decks around it. Um, and, you know, arguably some cards are going to be harder to play. But if you are willing to learn, you should identify those cards and then you should use the knowledge that you got from uh, analyzing data or looking through the data briefly. And then uh, basically, um, uh, by, armed with that knowledge, try to figure out the riddle why why those cards are just um, uh, not working for you and what to do in order to make them work. And uh, this, again, uh, answers will be, it might be the play pattern that you're doing with the particular card. Uh, maybe, for example, you flip them too early when they are like those two-faced Phyrexian creatures. Maybe you flip them too late if they are those two-faced Phyrexian creatures. 
maybe this draw spell that draws uh, uh, three out of the seven cards that you see on top of the library. I'm inventing a card here. Uh, maybe you it doesn't work for you because you don't select the right cards when it plays, and you need to think more about uh, which cards to select, and then and then maybe ask someone. Okay, I have this card. I see these cards. What would you pick to draw in this board state? And and they might answer. I would draw these three cards, and then especially this one because blah 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 blah. And if something in this scenario is uh, weird for you, and you know it, it's it's your idea versus the idea of again sixty plus percent win rate player. I would listen carefully to what the 60% plus player has to offer in terms of advice because um, this gives you at least an opportunity to rethink and, uh, and, 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 and start you know, analyzing why are they picking those cards and I would pick different ones. Um, also, arguably some of those cards are harder to play, which means that if you're a beginning draft player, you are going to have problems with maximizing the power of those cards. But on the other hand, if you don't start using them, you won't learn how to maximize that power. And I think this is one of those things that, yes, some cards are going to initially make you lose a bit. But over time, these, you know, playing those good cards is going to click and you're going to be there ready for um, um, for increasing your win rate because you're going to level up, and know better how to play, draft your decks, build them around. If you get stuck with the idea that, well, these cards just don't work for me, um, it is a rational idea on one hand, you're going to play the cards that work for you, but also then you have to um, run into a danger of uh, arriving at this um, uh, fake peak, which means that you're doing actions that put you on the peak of some kind of ability, but because you used wrong tools, you went up the wrong mountain. The actual peak is somewhere here, but because you learned to use the cards that are bad in order to get to the high peak, you're stuck on the lower one, and then your uh, win rate stagnates, and you are basically cannot jump over it, and, and, and you're stuck there, and you don't know what to do, because in order to improve from where you are, you need to walk back down and then go back up on the second peak, which means that you need to unlearn some things that you learned and then learn from the beginning uh, how to do things properly. Therefore, looking at what top players are doing uh, is also a good tool to backtrack from where you got stuck by uh, by following uh, wrong ideas and then, and then you can uh, rebuild yourself and level up. So sometimes you have to basically downgrade what you're doing, learn from the beginning, but with a different mindset, and then you can get to uh, uh, where the actual... Uh, peak of your win rate is. Okay, so um, here are some cards that um, no, I, I have a, actually a very good question from Super Gonzer. Um, do good players explore more at the start of the format? Um, no, and yes, it depends. It depends on the player. Uh, I know some good players who will explore a lot in the beginning of the format. I also know a lot of uh, good players that will abuse weakness in the beginning of the format. So um, there are sort of, uh, there are many groups of players and we are all diverse and uh, beautiful and in the ways that we are. But there is a bunch of players that um, will start playing the format and will say, okay, blue black is open. I'm just going to play blue black. And they are good technical players. They will have an amazing win rate um, and they will win a lot. Uh, there is a big group of players that say, oh, it's a new format. I'm going to learn all um, I can about this format and draft diverse decks. It will hurt my win rate, but it will be a learning experience. It will going to be fun. I'm not a good player, but I, I definitely belong to the group of exploring players. Um, I don't like forcing the deck and playing it always the same. If I have like a goal of, um, oh, I want to be mythic something, um, I might apply that kind of strategy because I would just say, ah, I, just, I, just, I, just, I just need to win a bunch of games. I'm going to play quick draft, force the same deck over and over again, and then um, uh, learn everything that there is for that particular deck. It's not a bad idea to do that because um, in in quick draft, very often can uh, can almost force something, 
And if you want to go really deep into a particular archetype, that's not a terrible thing to do because you can make those subtle changes in your builds and slightly tilt the balance from aggressive to more mid-range um, based on what you're drafting because you have such big choice of doing that that you can actually master one particular archetype and understand it much better. You know, now and then I do that just to, you know, pinpoint what are the most like important things. I particularly remember liking doing that in AFR uh, quick draft because you could build your uh, red, black um, steel and sacrifice deck in multiple ways. You could go more into the treasure synergy, ramping up very big things very early. Or you could go for the steel and sack uh, package, uh, or you could go for like super aggressive uh, aggro decks, uh, and all of those strategies were valid. And I wanted to explore them, so I played like I don't know ten quick drafts, and then just like played around with those ideas and got my idea of what I want to be doing in the format. Um, uh, but of course, uh, in the normal format, I would like to draft diverse decks and. Uh, I mean, every time I'm drafting a deck, I'm trying to test some kind of a hypothesis. And sometimes it's testable, sometimes it's not. But I like to do that. And uh, that's why my favorite format was Ikoria. I drafted it a lot for my standards. I probably had like 100-something drafts. I had like 40 trophies. And I think that out of the 40 trophies, uh, there were 28, 30 archetypes among them. So every time I drafted slightly differently and there was so much to uh, to be building around and those pockets of synergy that could be assembled as sort of like modular blocks between different types of decks. I loved Discovery in that format and I was just definitely exploring. But in the same Ikoria, there was a bunch of players that were just hard forcing um, uh, red-white cycling deck with Zenith Flares and they had amazing results with doing that. It's just that I think that a bunch of those players after the format finished we're only capable of drafting this white red cycling deck and and not much else uh while i had like a wider range of decks that i was capable of drafting in the format so yeah long story short it very much depends uh whether they explore or whether they uh force uh, the most powerful combination and both of those strategies have their benefits um jps and 54 um I believe the better players identify the bad cards of the bat. A chunk of those bad cards, yes, but a chunk of those bad cards, no. I think that good example from um, from the previous slides was uh, uh, Invasion of Kamigawa. I think that that card was played much, much more in the first week, uh, also uh, among the best players. Uh, but they quickly figured out that the card is not good. So it's not always that you see it like in the first couple of drafts, but you know, give it two weeks and good players will know that this is a bad card and they will probably avoid it like a plague, while um, um, uh, beginner players might not have that insight because partially maybe they play less, uh, but also, um, I don't know, as you play more, you learn to ask yourself questions continuously in order to improve uh, because you wouldn't jump certain levels if you didn't ask those questions. And I think that that's what um, um, more experienced players do better. It's the more introspective and and, and, and more analysis of what they're doing and, and, and what can be done to improve their uh, play. All right, so here we have the cards that uh, the good players are overplaying by quite a lot uh, compared to the um, uh, bottom tier of 17 lands users. And I think that the card that is most overplayed by the uh, by the good players is uh, overpicked, not overplayed, overpicked, picked uh, picked much higher. And I think that the card that uh, top players are picking much, much, much more than the, uh, than the bottom tier players is the Captive Weird. It's a one mana, one free defender. Uh, it has three and a red, Phyrexian red, uh, to flip it into a 3-3, you exile the top card of your library and you may play it until the end of your next turn. This card is just a house. It is good in aggressive deck because it's a one drop that can become a three drop. It gives you card advantage, whatever. Uh, it can be used to convoke spells. Uh, so, like, uh, you know, some people play the uh, blue-white decks where they play turn one captive weird or some other one drop turn to um, Halo Hopper and they have like a sort of three to two drop. Um, or they can use it to flip, attack the battle, draw a card um, uh, because they have low curve. Usually they will be able to cast that card. But also equally, this card is really good in 
controlling decks like blue black you play the captive weird it defends very well early because it's a one three later it flips into a threat it gives you a card uh, maybe sometimes you won't even have to pay two lives uh, so there are lots of small things that make this an absolutely great card uh, but it's not very apparent just how good this card is when you have to think that it's basically four mana three three draw a card uh, which is um, Saral Spackmate, which was the best common in Kaldheim. Um, and also you can split this mana on many ways. And um, and it also comes as a creature instantly, unlike Saral Spackmate, so it can do the blocking much earlier. It's absolutely phenomenal, this card. And I think that its quality might escape the more, um, uh, the, the more um, inexperienced players. And that's why we see this... Uh, uh, what is it? Uh, 28% pick rate for the uh, bottom tier players and 50% pick rate for the uh, top players. So like 30 percentage points of a difference between how the top players and the bottom tier players pick the card uh, aggressively. We have a bunch of other cards from the blue, black uh, and blue, white kind of uh, uh, situation. Art Atris, Oracle of Half Truths, amazing card, draws you one or two cards, which uh, with, with some selection potentially. Um, on a body that is, you know, three, two menace is actually pretty decent for four mana, uh, for four mana when it comes with, with a card or two. Also, not a card that is uh, easily ad identifiable as, um, as great. Uh, but also, I think that uh, top players are going to pick cards that are in the best archetypes much more frequently because of what, what we were talking with Super Gonzer. So um, uh, good players uh, forcing good color combinations because they know them. And I'm using the word forcing here, uh, which I know is a controversial way. Uh, good players leaning to play the best colors because they are the best color for, for a good reason. Of course, ironically, the top players, they have much flatter win rate across the archetypes and they win as much with, um, with the, what's considered bad archetypes as they do with um, good archetypes uh, which also makes it you know more difficult to analyze because you have to think then that oh well this this color is really bad it has like four percentage points lower win rate but then when you look at the data and you see that all this difference is um all this difference is caused by uh, beginner players or, or the bottom tier win rate uh, players uh, not being able to build those decks. But when you look at the top tier, there is not much difference between uh, this poor archetype and then the rest. Uh, you probably should reevaluate. Is this really a poor archetype or is it just like more difficult to play archetype? And maybe the archetype that can have a strong version but does not come together very often. Um, and that's a question that is a tricky one to answer, actually. Uh, but anyway, what do we have more? Skyclave Ariels, that's just another... This is, it's a very similar card to Captive Weird and has very similar stats. Two mana, two one flyer is just a very good rate uh, in this format, especially when you have some battles uh, lying around. Uh, and then and next card on the list is Invasion of Amonkhet, exactly this. If you play Sky Skyclave Aerialist and then Invasion of Amonkhet on turn two, you flip something big on either graveyard you can start bashing the invasion of Amonkhet because you know that soon you're going to flip it. And if you flip it and there's something like super powerful in the graveyard, yeah. even though you're going to lose a couple of life by doing this attack with your aerialists, um, you're, you're going to still stabilize the game because you're going to flip into an 8 hit or something. Or like a 4-4 four, four flyer double strife lightning. Uh, Artistic Refusal, the 6-mana counter spell with Convoke. Um, that's a card that will definitely benefit uh, from ability to play well. Uh, good players know when to expect something that needs to be countered. They do know um, uh, how to use artistic refusal more proficiently, and that will pay them in the win rate. But uh, it's also a double-edged sword. If you play against good players, uh, your artistic refusals are going to be much weaker because you know if you're left with six open mana, good opponent will smell out that you have this uh, artistic refusal in hand and they will play around it and present you with some lesser threat that you'll be happy to counter because that way you use the mana efficiently, uh, but you don't get the full benefit. And if you try to get the full benefit, you might actually find yourself, well, I spent three turns not tapping three mana because I wanted to keep the mana for refusal up. And then in the end, that means I could have played like a couple of free drops and the removal spell, but I didn't because of the refusal. 
Uh, preening champion, that's obviously the best common in the set, and uh, top players do recognize it. And you know, like the bottom tier players also do recognize it, but to much lesser extent. They don't prioritize it as highly. And this has something to do that um, with um, with maybe knowledge of the format. I do know that um, there is a much stronger correlation between the color pair win rate and what the top players are drafting than between color pair win rate and what uh, bottom tier players are drafting. So those beginner players, they will draft sort of random decks in a way they don't position themselves good in, look, I'm going to make those first couple of picks as if I was drafting the strongest deck. It doesn't mean that I'm stuck to draft the strongest um, deck on paper. Um, it just means that I want to give myself a chance to be in that deck if it's open. Uh, and if you do that, then frequently it will be open and you have a good deck. And if it doesn't work, you pivot to something else that you can identify, see strong signals, and then uh, uh, get rewarded by, uh, by being vigilant to the fact that the strong archetype that you wanted to soft force is not available. You move on to something else and you get a good result. Rather than maybe, you know, I unfortunately I don't have that data, but I would say I'm pretty sure that the beginner players are going to be more likely to um, uh, to stick their first pick, while better players are going to be more likely to abandon it. Uh, what else do we have? As far as dispersal, Yorion, Eyes of Gitaxias, all of those are staples in like blue black, and I think that uh, and to some extent in blue white. Uh, sort of leading me to think that uh, a bunch of those differences are caused by the fact that um, good players are indeed forcing, well, forcing, soft forcing uh, most powerful color combinations uh, more. Um, and uh, in the set, the top combinations of colors that you could draft was white, blue, and uh, white, uh, and blue, black. Uh, I wonder how many drafters are pure rare drafters who take every rare, even bad ones, no matter what. Huh. I don't know. I mean, the, this is an analysis that is possible. Uh, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe someone will have that as a patron questions at one stage, but I actually don't know. Um, I'm an opportunistic rare drafter. If I see a dra rare late and I don't need anything from that pack, I'll pick it. No problem. I also do the same with uncommons because of vault progress. So I I am a very lawful opportunistic rare drafter. I'm pretty sure that there are lawful uh, compulsory rare drafters that will always draft rares. And I'm pretty sure that there are players like that. It does make sense if you want to build your collection. In fact, Sacrificing a couple of picks might still lead you to have a decent deck. The trick, Mercurio, is to draft 12 rares in one draft and then still manage to squeeze all of them in your deck and then 7-0. I did it once in my life and it felt great. <laughs> um, um, so what do we have there? Grim Green, Fairy Mastermind, Lurus, Hello Forager, Chrome Host, Seed Shark, Zephyr Singers. These are all cards that, you know... <clears throat> um, Bottom tier drafters will still pick Chrome Host Seed Shark 75% of the time they see it, but top drafters will pick it 87.7% of the time. So this is the difference, like top players, when they see the shark, they will almost always nab it because it's such a low mana and uh, requirement card. It's not so bad late in the game because you're going to still accrue the uh, value from it that you can even consider splashing it. So you might pick it whenever you see it because the power of the card is just so strong. Zephyr Singer, um, here, 78 to 66%. I think that top tier players pick it more frequently because they are so much more frequently in blue and uh, it always fits their uh, fits their idea. So I think that that's, that's more or less what, what's happening in there. Um, in terms of the play rate, there is no such huge differences in play rate as um, as we saw in the um, bad cards. So this is the part when I told you that uh, it's much easy to recognize, much much easier to recognize good cards. Like here we have like a whole one game difference in playing, so uh, roughly twenty percent uh, 
dex more uh, if you recalculate it to the dex numbers. And here, the biggest difference we have is isogetaxias, and that's only 0.7 game difference. And then the, those differences become quite small um, at 15. So this, these cards are from all rarities in, in, in order of uh, what has the biggest difference between the two uh, bars on the graph uh, uh, to the smallest difference. So like 15 cards deep, the difference in playing Rona Herald of Invasion is just like 0.4 games um, uh, on average. So it won't make the, uh, the deck uh, of bottom players uh, just a bit more frequently. So, um, uh, but when you look at this card, Eyes of Gitaxias, Omen Hawker, Zimon and Dina, Marauding Dreadship. Uh, that's okay. Marauding Dreadship is a weird one, but like most of those cards are blue and 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 around blue uh, colors. Uh, Marauding Dreadship is slightly different. I think that uh, beginner players don't appreciate how important is our cards that make multiple pieces of cardboard. And um, Marauding Dreadship might look unappealing. Uh, just a 4-1 vehicle can be blocked by anything. Um, but it's not that only. It does um, it does generate this incubate token, which is great for some decks. And uh, it can induce some artifact synergies, which actually are present in this um, archetype. And also it combos very well with um, Tetsuko Umezawa, the fugitive one card that also is on this list that um, top players are playing uh, more uh, in their decks. Because, of course, Tetsuko is a 1-3 that gives unblockability to creatures with power or toughness equals 1. Uh, Dreadship is a 4-1 um, vehicle. So with Tetsuko, you can just basically crew it every turn and swing for 4 unblockable. And it's great. Um, and we have Baral, um, Transcended Message, the blue-blue-blue-blue-blue uh, X uh, draw spell with Confog. Uh, Borborygmus and Fiddletip. Here, again, you need to splash a bit. Uh, most of the time, <clears throat> but Borborygmus is in green, and it's a very good card, and I think that top players do uh, um, identify it. And we have like a bunch of other legends here. Atris, again, Tetsuko, Muzawa, Hidetsu, and Kairi, Inga, Runa, is Jinji, Daxias, and Rona, Herald of Invasion. All those cards um, uh, played more by the by, by, by top win winner player. Um, uh, 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 where was I? See, yeah, MTG. Did I miss them? Oh, I see. MTG definitely does that five color soup. Uh, yeah, and five color soup is also like this is a deck that will be definitely, um, uh, uh good players will just do better with it because it's tricky to build mana base, decisions are difficult, usually you're on the back foot, which is also something that the beginner players are not going to be happy with. So, there's parts of those things that getting a certain skill level will open archetypes to you that are previously not open. And I looked at the five color win rates uh, for the previous seminar and um, uh, the, the bottom tier players had a much, much lower win rate with those five color decks than the top players. So top players paid much less penalty for playing five colors because they know how to build those decks and what is needed in them and how the mana base has to be arranged in order for you to be cast everything, to be casting everything. So then we had this fold difference in play rate again. Um, so the card that is the top of the list is Omen Hawker, which was 2.3 times more played by the good players than by the uh, low win rate players. And when you compare that with the same numbers for um, uh, bad cards, uh, Jinji Taxis and uh, Seizen, eight times more frequently played. Uh, uh, Yargul, five times roughly. Vorin Clegg's Voice of Hunger, five times roughly. Um, uh, Atraxas for four times. So here, the difference we see, Omen Hawker, 2.3 times more played uh, by the top players than the, by the bottom players. This difference is smaller. So uh, it means that the lower win rate players can identify that those cards are good, uh, even though they have some minor differences. So I looked at the win rates of those cards overplayed by top players by uh, more than 50%. So... Uh, this one is overplayed by 60%. This one is overplayed by 130%. So we will go maybe a couple of more bars here. And and, and, and I checked win rates, average win rate of the, of the whole bunch of those cards. It was 60.9%. And then I looked at the cards that low win rate players overplay by 50% plus. Um, 
And here, you know, this is overplayed by 730%. This is overplayed by 320%. So those bad cards are way more overplayed by the, uh, by the bottom win rate players uh, than, than the good cards are overplayed by the top win rate players, which sort of proves the point that Playing bad cards is a bigger problem than um, than not being identified and able to identify good cards. I mean, obviously, both of them you need to do, uh, but it seems to me that um, um, yeah, uh, playing the bad cards is a more burning issue for the uh, player that wants to level up uh, than playing the good cards because they are probably okay identifying the good cards. So, what actions can you take for that? Like, first of all look at cards that top players play a lot do you ask yourself some questions like do you prioritize those guys cards highly like do, when you when i see captive weird in the deck in a, in a pack if there is no like busted rare i'm going to probably pick it because that's how good the card is if you're not having that thought uh if you think that hey, you know what i'd rather have phyrex and gargantua than the uh, captive weird then you clearly is something not okay with your evaluation in this format i'm talking about early picks later in the game obviously if you're in black and not in blue you're going to slam that uh, firex and gargantua easy peasy but um uh, but in the early draft if you want to pick the gargantua then maybe um then maybe you should reevaluate uh, your pick orders because uh i'm quite convinced that um uh, captive weird is a uh, almost strictly better card than the Gargantua is. That was an example that is theoretical, of course. Uh, now you can, uh, but you can find one for yourselves. Like, do I overplay some card that the top players are not playing? Are the top players playing a lot with a card that I think is not good? And if that's the case, you might want to think. Either you're doing something wrong with the card, um, uh, you're building the decks maybe not accordingly to what the card is needing, um, or maybe you don't maximize the card's utility because you just don't play it 100% right. Um, do you speculate on those good cards? This is another thing, like, uh, you know, like pick pack one, pick five. Uh, I don't see much for the, you know, deck that would be made out of the first four cards that I picked. Maybe there's something in there that I think, oh, that may be actually quite cute. Uh, and, and if it's open, I can, I can move on. Um, I think that, uh, you know, this is the question you should be asking yourself uh, frequently. Do I speculate enough? Do I, because speculation is just like leaving yourself open to swoop and swapping into different color. And I think top win rate players do that quite a lot. In fact, they sort of um, are married to their first pick slightly less, even though if it's possible, they will probably more aggressively uh, play their first pick than the weaker, uh, the lower win rate players. But at the same time, uh, they are not stuck to that idea. Um, why is there a split between what how you evaluate the card and how the top players evaluate the card? You have to think about it. Uh, I think that it's very important to start thinking about it because that will lead you to, um, uh, to point three, and that is have a plan. Um, and plan can be in multiple ways. I was already talking about drafting with preferences, and this is a very good plan. This is the pl part of the plan that you apply before you start your draft. This is sort of a ley line of plans uh, where you can cast it before uh, you actually play a land. Um, and I think that the important finding here, I looked at the play rate of uh, different archetypes, and the top players are in blue, the bottom players are in red. Uh, top players play Azorius 25% of the time and Demir 24% of the time. And the same numbers for the bottom tier players is 19.4 and 18.2. Uh, so quite a large rift. It's like two most common archetypes um, uh, in the top players are played 49% of the time, which is a bit sad because that format is my, way more diverse than trying to force these two. Um, but the lower win rate players, uh, they only have 37-ish uh, percent of playing with those two decks. Um, so big preference for top players to play those two powerful uh, color combinations. Um, and then almost all of the other color combinations, uh, it's the bottom players that play them more frequently because, of course, uh, those numbers add up to 100%. 
Um, right. So, um, but plan is not only applied on this like early start of before you start doing the draft. Plan is also something that you have in your mind while drafting. And of course, plan is something that you have in your head while playing, but data cannot help with that. You need to find a different person to explain you all the intricacies of how to play with cards and, and how to use uh, uh, how to use uh, advice and stuff like that. But I looked at specifically white blue archetype because apart from knowing that the card is good, you probably, and here we go one level higher than the first pieces of advice that I gave, um, you need to know how you want your deck to look like. You need to have like a vision of this kind of skeleton of a deck and which cards are the important pieces and which cards are an absolute must and which cards are sort of like replaceable. Um, to depict it, the story for me from that format, I played a bunch of three color soul tie decks. And uh, it's not like a perfect format for playing three colors, this one, but if you put a bit of effort, a bit of elbow grease, put a couple of cards that you want to have, you can easily play a three color deck. Uh, and I noticed that my Sultai piles were doing very well when I had like three, four pieces of good removal and very bad when I had when I didn't make it there. Uh, so my draft plan for those decks now is I will speculate on removal earlier uh, than on uh, you know good uncommons because I know that I need those re this removal because this format has a bunch of bombs. I want to be able to kill those bombs because I'm planning to play a long game with my Sultai deck, because those decks want to prolong the game. The unfortunate side effect of prolonging the game is giving your opponent more threat, the draw steps. And because you give them more draw steps, uh, it instantly um, becomes more likely that they will draw that bomb that will wreck you. So you better have removal at hand to, um, uh, to deal with it. And if you want to have removal at hand to deal with it, well, you must probably prioritize removal spells. Um, so these are pick rates um, of, uh, of, no, these are play rates of particular cards, not pick, but play, um, uh, by, um, uh, by uh, top players and, and by bottom tier players. And first thing what you can say is that uh, both groups played Swords on Cavalier the most. It was 8% of the you know, commons uh, uh, data comes from Swords on Cavalier in blue-white archetype and roughly 7.8 from the bottom tier. So there is a difference, but it's not a large difference. But we move to the next card and Aerial Boost, 6.7% of the games played data um, uh, in blue-white from the top players is uh, aerial boost, but only 4.5 in this bottom win rate tier of players. So clearly the difference between how top players see the blue white deck is a deck that has aerial boosts. And if you don't draft that card, then clearly you either know something that they don't know, or you're losing uh, value there because you should be picking those aerial boosts a bit more aggressively. I'm not saying first picking them because they go quite late in the draft, but just um, uh, when you are in the middle of the pack and you have like some menial replaceable creature and aerial boost, pick the aerial boost because you will see creatures in that draft, I can assure you, uh, but you may never see a second, um, uh, a second um, uh, aerial boost. Um, another card where we see the difference is temporal cleansing. 4.8% of the common data in top players, but only 3.1% of the data of the common data in um, in the bottom win rate tier players. So temporal cleansing offers you quite a nifty interaction spell that is also good in control decks and also good in aggressive decks. In aggressive decks, you can just like push it out and and, and go face, and opponent is still you know a couple of turns from recasting the thing and using more mana to do so. Um, so yeah, that, that kind of direction is pretty important. Um, and I think that the last card I wanted to show uh, that, um, blue, black top players are playing more aggressively is the Tarkir Dune Shaper. And that probably is resulting from the fact that, um, you have, um, you have, um, a variant of blue, white that 
wants to have a bunch of um, a bunch of um, um, a bunch of one drops and uh, uh, halo hoppers. Um, what value is your data? The y-axis. Uh, David Tron asks. It's a good question. I don't know why it doesn't display on the axis. This is. Oh, actually, let, 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 let's do it like that. Give me, give me a second. Uh, says so empty lands, uh, card statistics, because I think that uh, in this particular presentation, it would be useful to uh, actually go um, to go through uh, to the mothership and uh, and see what I'm talking about exactly. Uh, Seventeen lands. Okay, share. So we have the 17 lands uh, card performance table. What I did for that is I went to old X, blue white, uh, rarity, common. I looked at the commons that are used in blue white. Uh, I looked at the top players. And what I calculated there is number of game, games played. This is um, uh, the data. It's how many games were played with aerial boost, like 18,000 games played with aerial boost by the top players. Uh, so I did this. And I summed up all those games played. And then I took the number from aerial boost, divided by all the games played. And then I come up with, and then I come up with, uh, 6.7%. So aerial boost was 6.7% of all the games you played by a common card. So um, uh, it's a very highly played common. Um, and uh, and then I did the same, but I just changed the top player into the bottom player. And then I come with 4.5% with that calculation, which means that aerial boost is not such a strongly played common by those uh, bottom players because they don't understand it. And there is one card that is significantly overplayed by uh, by the uh, bottom tier players, and that's Order of the Mirror, uh, which is a fine card. It's a playable card, but I think that um, the bottom players clearly had an over appreciation of what it does, uh, and 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 that probably leads to a lot of lost games, because uh, I've seen this pattern so frequently when people play this on turn two and flip it on turn three. Um, attack, uh, get a forest dispersal or something like that into it, and they basically are without the board, wasting two life and a whole turn to flip this 3 3 that was bounced for one mana. It's a disaster if you do that. Um, obviously, uh, Order of the Mirror has some synergies, it's good with um, it's good with Omen Hawker, it uh, is good with knights, and um, but you know, if you're playing knights, you'd rather have swords and cavalier as your two drop knight uh, than order of the mirror. Uh, but uh, I don't know why it had free free flanker has some appeal to those beginner players, and they tend to overdraft it. Now, if you see that uh, almost every card on that list of the top 15 cards played, um, is Picked and now it's played more highly by the top uh, top tier uh, player group, except for that uh, order of the mirror and yeah, order of the mirror is literally the only one that has a higher number. But when you think about it, I mean, in the end, those cards should add up to one hundred percent. What does it mean for the data? Uh, it means that top players focus on a much more narrow subset of cards um, uh, within an archetype and mainly draft those narrow subset cards. I looked at it because maybe at, at the beginning I thought, you know, maybe may, maybe it's because um, uh, uh, the bottom win rate tier uh, players draft more rares. And because of that, they play fewer commons. And that's why the numbers are slightly skewed. But it's not the case at all. So uh, that can't be the truth. Um, and this means only one thing. Those lower win rate players, very frequently, they will have those substandard, longer tail kind of cards in their deck. So uh, they will have many more cards that cross the 1% threshold on that kind of value that I calculated. And in, in fact, this is true, um, uh, as you will see in a second. Uh, what do we have still here? Um, we also have the pick rate of, uh, oh, we did this already, didn't we? Uh, 
this is the play rate uh, of the color. This is the uh, play rate of the card. And there's also differences in, in the pick rates within the archetype. And in the white blue, top players have a prior high priority of, of, of several cards. And that includes Preying Champion, which is picked 60% of the time people see it uh, versus 6, 46 uh, for the bottom tier, uh, win rate tier players. Uh, Eyes of Gitaxias, uh, top players pick it roughly a third of the time they see it. Um, um, uh, bottom win rate, lower win rate players pick it roughly 20% of the time, so 13 percentage point difference between those. Uh, as far as dispersal, top players prioritize it very highly, 42% of the time they see it, they pick it, uh, but it's only 30% for the uh, lower win rate players. And, you know, maybe a couple of other cards worth mentioning that have roughly 10% differences. Uh, as far as dispersal, um, that's not as far as dispersal, sorry. Uh, temporal cleansing, um, uh, cyber cryptomancer, and uh, meeting of minds. Those cards are more valued by the by the top uh, top tier win rate players in terms of picking them in a draft. Uh, so yeah, uh, when I said that all those cards from the top um, uh, top plate commons in in, in blue white um, have higher value in top player group than in the bottom player group. And the reason for that is that top players play a narrow uh, collect selection of cards that only, you know, only 24 of the commons are present in over 1% of the games. Uh, uh, well, not 1% not of the games, but, uh, you know, they take up 1% of the played games. Um, in terms of lower win rate players, it's 31 commons that do over 1% of the games. And then there's still like a bunch of cards that are under one that is also more in in the group of um uh, in the group of uh, uh lower win rate players so this means that uh lower win rate players use a larger variety of cards and what this means is that obviously not all the cards are good this brings us back to the situation from the first step uh people display too many of the bad cards and uh, again we can only speculate, is it because of the want of playing those um, uh, not so good cards or is it because of the need of playing them because uh, you can't just draft um, uh, a coherent deck because you dirtle or because uh, because you wasted some picks on I don't know what. Maybe even rare drafting. Um, and you know, that doesn't seem like much to 24 commons in over 1% of the games versus 31 commons over, uh, in over 1% of the games. But those things accumulate again, because that means that you will play maybe two bad cards, maybe three, maybe four bad cards uh, in your deck, because your plan is not good enough. It's not consistent enough. You're picking those cards all around the board, while top players know exactly. Look, if I'm drafting white blue, I want to have these cards. I want to have Marshall. I want to have uh, a two drop that is a three one. I want to have uh, Aerial boost. Uh, um, I want to have maybe one interaction spell uh, like temporal cleansing, um, and I want to have a bunch of knights or or, or a package of um, uh, halo hopper and uh, and a bunch of one drops, and they know that, and they sort of pick it. Hey, Arstel, uh, our roles reversed yesterday. I was in Arstel's chat. Now he is in mine. There we go. Um, which, by the way, recommend recommend his stream. Uh, uh, it it was it was a lot of fun yesterday. Um, and thanks for the rain, obviously. Um, so uh, so yeah, because you have this streamlined pool of cards that you want to build in your deck, your deck are going to be much more consistent and therefore are going to win more because they they are focused. And the lower win rate players are all over the place. They are playing cards that shouldn't be in those decks, possibly. Um, and especially like late in the format, um, uh, when we know more or less how a white blue deck should be looking at, those top win rate players are super streamlined, while the lower win rate players are slightly all over the place. Um, Metal Mario probably said something that makes sense. Um, I'd say card evaluation is one of the harder skills to develop as a new player. It takes a while to understand what makes a good card in Magic and then adjust based on the different formats. Yeah, and that's that's again what I'm preaching. It's, it's going to be hard for you to be able to evaluate the cards on your own. That's why I'm telling to use the 17 lens data to evaluate the cards. 
And then based on the evaluation and look through the data, start asking yourself questions. Why is this card good? And then start coming up to the answers um, um, on how on the subset of cards that you know have a proven track record. Because if you see the track record and, and, and you see that the card is clearly working for those good players, you can start asking yourself the questions, why are they working and how can I make them work myself? And, and, and that's, that's how uh, I'm trying to preach in this particular episode. You should be approaching it. You should be looking at those um, uh, cards that work for top players and try to start figuring out why does it do. And again, using all the tools available to you, including asking people who are uh, in this group of the top uh, win rate players. Uh, right, we're almost there. So what actions can you take to b build better plans for your decks? Um, so you, these are the questions that I would want early, um, uh, early career players to ask themselves. Can you envisage how does a deck uh, you're drafting wants to look like? Um, what do you think are the key elements in it? So which cards do you want to have in it? And uh, if you have the list of the cards that you want to have in it, are any of those cards uh, among the group of the cards that the top players seem not to value? And then, of course, if, if, if it, they are not, it doesn't mean that the card is bad in the deck. Maybe you're right. Maybe you figure something out new. But there is a solid chance if you're a beginning player that it's you, not them, uh, and that maybe you're playing a card that you shouldn't be playing because you think too much. Again, as we were talking uh, earlier in the seminar, maybe you visualize those uh, uh, Christmas Candyland scenarios a bit too much, and uh, maybe um, uh, maybe you don't see the the floor that is quite low on a particular card. We were talking about this uh, uh, sale back that, uh, you know, sometimes it's amazing because it's like five mana kill a very important permanent for your opponent and get a three, four body. And it's great then. Uh, but uh, very often it's just going to be free for haste. So sort of a mech creature that jumps on board that, that, that blanks it. So it doesn't do very much and you spend five mana on that. So, yeah. So these are the kind of questions that I want, uh, uh, you know, the beginner players to ask themselves in order to start figuring out how to have a plan. Now, this episode is sort of aimed at, uh, at beginner to intermediate players. And then, of course, there are further steps when you want to like properly master the uh, limited game, but these are not within the scope. But there is one very important thing that I would like to uh, hammer on. It's been leeching through uh, to other parts of the seminar. But um, it's very important at this stage to learn from the others because um, very few people are capable of figuring out how limited works only on their own. And there's like plenty of content. Um, there is um, uh, plenty of useful tools on the 70 lands. Like for example, you can analyze the recent trophy decks. If you don't know how a particular archetype works, you just can go to the trophy page of the 70 lands look at five, six um, decks within a particular color pair and see what's uh, what's in them and what you think is strange that is in them. If, if, if a card is there and you think like, hmm, what, what is this doing in there? Uh, maybe, you know, once it's, it's just an accident that the card was there. But, you know, if you look through eight decks uh, in a particular color pair and you see the same card like six times, you must start thinking, you know what? Maybe this card is actually good. And then it can go on your radar and you can dig deeper in thinking how you would play this card. And, and then you can ask questions to maybe some of the people that played those decks. Why is this thing good in red-white? Or do you think it's good in red-white? And if you do, then why? Um, I would say look through other people's gameplay because data can help you. 17 Lens can help you, but it won't teach you how to play the game. It won't teach you the correct play patterns. It won't teach you those small things like reading or what the opponent has in their hand, um, um, sequencing your attacks, learning when to play your removal spells, figuring out that instant doesn't mean you have to cast it at the end of the turn of the opponent. You can cast it on your turn as a sorcery. No problem, no shame with that if that, you know, if that gives you additional insurance against a counter spell, for example. Um, I say watch play streams if you want to get better. I think that uh, Corticals is like very good 
stream to learn how to um, how to play. Uh, Numo Dynami is a very good stream to learn how to play. Uh, just Lola Man is good, but probably if you're already like intermediate at least. Um, Ham TV is good if you're like sort of intermediate at least. I think that um, some of the concepts that Ham is selling are, are 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 maybe too advanced if you're a beginner. But I think like Corticals and Numod, I think are great streams to learn. Um, and so to an extent is uh, Ethan and um, Mr. Metronome Ben Warney. Uh, they are all really great for learning how to do that. So yeah, I would I would recommend those. Uh, those things. And uh, plenty of other streamers. Just uh, just find the one that is is your jam and try to learn. Uh, and ask for advice. I think that um, the gathering part of Magic seems to be working also online. If you don't know how to build a deck, tag people on Twitter. I'm happily tagged, um, you know, a couple of times every week. Uh, uh, in someone building a deck and asking for last cuts or some advice, um, and you know, sometimes I give it, sometimes I, I'm just tired and I just ignore it. Uh, posting games from 17 lines to look uh, through the review of your gameplay that's also an excellent feature. Um, uh, so yeah, use those tools because uh, uh, learning everything on your own is not easy and, and very often will defeat the point. Um, yeah. And that was the last step, I think. So I would like to acknowledge the 17 lens team because obviously lots of my content is based on the 17 lens data um, uh, stuff. Uh, Viral misnomer, especially, and Ale Ballini ZTM, uh, they work pretty hard to make everything work. Uh, there's a bunch of other people involved, and uh, you know all of them are putting in hours to make sure that everything is tip top. I would also like to thank Fake Jake Brown, uh, who is helping me with the uh, release of this in a podcast form as long as I push myself to send them the audio files. Um, and I would like to, of course, thank mtgazone.com for sponsoring me uh, and for publishing my articles. Uh, it's a great fun to write those things up because my sort of semi-chaotic seminar uh, can be streamlined into a more polished form uh, in, in writing. And um, yeah, I would also thanks, uh, like to thank my patrons um, uh, who are supporting me and. Um, you know, not only financially, but the fact that I have a question of the week uh, from uh, from from certain tiers of my patrons is also helping me to uh, to maybe ask myself questions that I normally wouldn't do. Like, for example, last week's episode about uh, five color uh, decks, or two weeks ago uh, episode uh, about five color decks, because last week I was doing limited resources. Um, it sort of was an idea from a question I got from a patron. So, you know, in, in that way, it's worth to um, uh, to subscribe and, and get impact on how I'm making this show so it's more honed towards what you're interested in. Um, and also, um, and also, I would like to thank SSQ and Mana Junkie, who are, are people responsible for the music I'm using in the podcast version of that. Um, and with that, I'll see you next week.